Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Pinion Juniper Forest of Utah. This time, I'm somewhere in western Kane County at about 6,000 feet in elevation. And let's jump right into the video today because truly, I think the Pinion Juniper Forests are one of the most underrated habitats in the West, and they're certainly one of the most important. They truly bisect the West in the sense that they straddle the intermediate area between the high montane forests and the low, vast shrublands of the valley bottoms occupying this sort of middle elevation area between 5,000 and 8,000 feet. And because of this, they have a pretty high ecological importance. Plants from both ecosystems can be found throughout. And the biodiversity is very high and there's a lot of unique species here. And it's also very great for wildlife. So let's get this video started. Now, pinion juniper is basically a catch-all term to refer to any forest in the West comprised primarily of any juniper species and any pinion pine species. and Depending on where you are, which species of juniper and which species of pinion pine will vary. Here, for instance, it is primarily the two-needle pinion, Pinus adulis, and the good old Utah juniper, Juniperus osteosperma. Further west in the Great Basin, it'll primarily be spilled Utah juniper, but it will instead be two-needle or single-leaf pinion, Pinus monophylla, that dominates. You can also find quite a lot of other species in these forests, such as this guy right here. That leafless tree is Quercus gambilii, a tree I've talked about quite a lot in my Wasatch Foothill videos, but when I think that truly comes into its own light in the forest down south in Utah. And uh, you know, very often you'll find forests composed only of juniper or only of pinion pine. Right here, for instance, although I did show you that one pinion pine, it is very, very heavy on a juniper, but it'll still be referred to as a pinion juniper forest generally because it's really about the ecological niche and elevation band that this forest occupies in between you know, the low desert shrublands and the high elevation forests. One notable thing about this particular pinion juniper forest is that the soils are extremely sandy. I mean, I think they're pretty much entirely sand, most likely derived from the sort of Navajo sandstone cliffs nearby, but whatever formation they come from, the effect is uh, certainly large and the plants that can grow here. I think actually that's part of the reason why the juniper is so dominant and the pinion pine is less common. I notice in places where the soil is extremely sandy, the pinion pine doesn't flourish as well, or it might be completely absent. I mean, this is the perfect elevation for uh, pinion pines. Normally they like the higher elevation areas, while juniper is like the lower elevation areas within the pinion juniper forest continuum. So, you know, when you're hiking up a mountain from shrubland into pinion juniper, the first species you will find is almost always going to be juniper and then eventually pinion will join it and perhaps later on you'll get forests entirely of pinion pine as you continue to move to higher and higher elevations. Right here about 6,000 feet it's a prime spot for both to be mixing but we really only get a lot of juniper and again I do suspect this is because the soil is just so sandy. Now I'd be amiss here to not talk about some of the other great species you can find in this forest so let's do that really quick. This guy, this little cacti is Apuncha aria or perhaps Apuncha Polyacantha variety aria, or maybe even Apuncha arenacea variety aria. See, no one can exactly agree on how to classify these small little cacti that you can find all throughout the West and the Great Plains. So, some people consider them all a species of Polyacantha, some break them into a few species, some break them up into many species. Regardless, this variety or species can only be found really around Kane County in southern Utah. So, it's a little bit unique and cool to see it here. I mean, not cool, it's what you'd expect, but it is cool the fact that you won't find it anywhere else. And what really stands out about it is that it doesn't have any regular spines, it has glockids. See, most cacti, like this guy over here, have spines, but opunchas also have these little annoying hair-like spines called glockids, which are basically made of silica. Um, this one also has it, but it also is not worth having spines. I should be quite clear, this is definitely a different species. This one is Apuncha Thayacantha, I believe, variety major. Again, there's a whole big controversy on what exactly varieties there are that exist of this species and whatnot. It's one of the distinguishing features is that it has spines of differing lengths. So you can see, look right at the top there especially. From each little node, there are some short spines and there are some really long spines. And that's one of the things that makes this species stand out. And of course, you talk about some of the few great shrubs you can find here. This guy with the weird spindly branches is a green Mormon tea, also known as a Phedra viridis. Species typically found at lower elevations, but here in a relatively high rainfall environment, instead of growing just be a small two foot shrub, it can be a sprawling up to four foot tall shrub. In fact, I think I've even seen some in this forest that were close to six feet tall, which is pretty impressive. 
as I must have said before about the ephedras, they are a type of netophyte, which is a weird grouping of plants that aren't really flowering plants, but also aren't conifers. It's just a very odd ancient lineage of seed producing plants that don't really fit with any of our major groups, such as, you know, the pines, flowering plants, or cycads. But they've managed to survive nonetheless in a few places around the world, such as the deserts of the American Southwest. Another excellent plant, too, is this guy over here. This is a species of rabbit brush. Most likely, I think, Ericamaria nauseosa, but it could also be a Chrysophemnus visitiflorus. I'm not exactly sure what the second part of that name is, but it's a little difficult to tell them apart, especially this time of year when there's so little vegetation. It is very obvious, though, that it's a rabbit brush by the way it's growing, and the fact that it has this inflorescence that is a dead giveaway for the family Asteraceae. So close we get in there. It's got these very compound looking florets, which, I mean, that's really what makes Asteraceae a family. They're all united by the unique capitulum type inflorescence, where a bunch of flowers group together to look like a larger flower. There's a few other good shrubs around here, too. Another one really quick. Artemisia tridentata. You all know it if you're even remotely familiar with plants out west. Perhaps the synonymous plant with the west, aside from maybe, I don't know, tumbleweed, but that one's not even native, so it doesn't deserve that recognition, even in the slightest. A lovely plant, not so abundant up here, but it does grow quite well and healthy in a few specimens. Like that one. And you know, you really can't talk about the pinion juniper forest of Utah without talking about this plant up there. That little thing, which looks like a bunch of big tangled mass of juniper branches, is actually a species of mistletoe. It's a Phorodendron juniperinum. It primarily affects, or actually it only infects, juniper species, especially Utah junipers and pinyon juniper forests. This tree is absolutely covered in them. Unlike some mistletoe species, which produce violently explosive fruits with the goal of, you know, scattering the seeds up and over treetops, this one produces berries, which I can't find any right now, but birds will eat them and then they'll crap them out onto um, branches of upper poor junipers, which will then be afflicted with these parasites. They're not really dangerous for the junipers, but they do sap nutrients from them and can cause damage to the branches at times, which is undesirable for them. Now, I hope you guys come away from this video appreciating the pinion juniper forest a lot more. It's, I think, a very underrated habitat in the state of Utah and the West in general. Many people don't like it very much for a variety of reasons. Ranchers certainly hate it because it's uh, it's been encroaching in their habitat. Well, encroaching, that's a bit of a loaded term because overgrazing is the reason why it's encroaching everywhere, primarily, as well as fire suppression. But regardless, it's a really good habitat with a lot of great species in it. I hope you guys can come away appreciating that. So thanks for watching and see you next time. I mean, right here, this soil is extremely sandy and pinion pine is definitely not very dominant, despite this being a great elevation for the plant to grow. Jesus Christ, I just walked in that cacti. Here. <laughs> Got a spine in my shoe, but I don't actually feel it, thank God.